Hey guys, uh, I have long preached that contrary to m most entrepreneurs, acquisition is equally as important as innovation, right? So when do you know when to start a business from scratch or whether to acquire one? Okay, what, how do you know whether you should be innovating in your space or uh, growing through acquisition? Get ready because today we're going to look at some research and we're going deep to figure out how to, how to determine that. My name is Walker Dival. I am the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Buy Then Build and creator of the Acquisition Lab. So, you know, understanding the industry landscape is absolutely critical to determining whether you should, you know, start a business from scratch or acquire an existing business to get started. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, it's, it's, it's the industry that's going to um, lay the groundwork uh, for, you know, the macro trends and whether, whether a space is ripe or not. Uh, for, for e e which one of these. So there's a new research report from McKinsey Consulting that came out called uh, Lots of Small M&A Add Up to Big Value, okay? And the concept here is that when they looked at companies uh, over time, the ones that, that built the greatest value, the greatest enterprise value that won out more market share and all the rest of it, it was the ones that built a systematic regular pursuit of acquisitions proactively that beat out, you know, those that were just going after large, you know, uh, keynote, um, keystone deals, uh, very selective deals or opportunistic deals and uh, organic growth, okay? In other words, uh, the, the, the key determinant in understanding who the, the winner of any uh, industry is ultimately um, small to medium sized business X plus one, where X is the number of companies you currently own. <laughs> in other words, um, buy, those that buy uh, small to medium sized businesses over time are the ones that ultimately are the winners. So again, there needs to be an initial innovation, okay? And then, uh, uh, and then acquisition sort of folds in into it, okay? So why is this, all right? So the, the reason is that when you're going after small to mid sized businesses, um, it, it, you know, many small or moderate acquisitions over time add up to big market share, okay? And that's how market share gets, gets acquired over time. Uh, second, you have a lot of repeated attempts um, at sort of getting it right and, and, you know, shooting a lot of bullets, as Jim Collins would say. Um, and also, the smaller acquisitions for a company are financially affordable. So you're, that company is sort of financially diversified in terms of like which one of these is, is going to work and, and, and be a winner, right? Um, the thing is, is that McKinsey also determined something else, which is that most firms, okay, are challenged to transition to this sort of programmatic uh, M&A initiatives, okay? And, um, you know, why? Why is that? <clears throat> and I think it's because... Um, it's not perceived, okay, um, as, as, as something that needs to be a core competency in entrepreneurship or in business, especially when you've got a product, you know, that really works. And so the thing is, is that the people that do get really good at it, okay, have this kind of invisible uh, competitive advantage, right? And, and, you know, in comparison to their, their competitors. And so when you have dedicated, um, systematized m and teams, uh, McKinsey, uh, also determined that they spend more time on culture and integration uh, post-merger, okay? So any of us that have an MBA know that 50%, it's something like half of all large uh, acquisitions or publicly traded acquisitions uh, never uh, extract the value that they thought they would, okay? It's, it's, a, it's actually a terrible uh, metric. Um, and, and, and the thing is, is that when you look at that data time and time and time again, the number one reason why mergers fail to extract value is because of culture, okay? And because of post-merger integration um, inefficiencies and frankly, failure, okay? So getting good at understanding culture and integration of these things uh, is the thing that um, uh, ultimately is the, is the failure rate. And those that have programmatic M&A efforts are, are able to uh, manage that and spend a lot more time on it. So the, the point here is that M&A or acquisition really should be an enduring capability for you, just as it is for the most valuable companies, okay? Let's take a look at the consolidation curve here. An article from Harvard Business School uh, uh, just came out and said, long-term success depends on how it moves through the stages of industry consolidation. 
okay? Ultimately, uh, merger competence is everything. It's the one that wins the game, right? And so the thing is, is there's these four stages, okay? You've got, you know, one, two, three, four. Okay, the first is the opening. The second is the scale. The third is focus. And the fourth is balance, okay? And here's kind of how it breaks down. Number one is the opening, okay? We'll just put an O for opening. The opening is the part where there's a new technology or a new player that comes out and sort of introduces the company, okay? And the thing is, is that, you know, during this time, during this early stage, during the opening, there's, you know, the top three companies own 100% of all the market share. This is the market, they're sort of defining it. The industry hasn't taken off yet, it hasn't even, it's being created, okay? And so this is sort of the opening. Um, and we find that, um, uh, we'll get into this in a minute, but we find that being able to acquire assets at an opening, being able to acquire competitors at an opening, turns out to be rather key, okay? And so uh, you maintain that market share at that time. Then you've got um, scale, okay? This is that sort of adolescent part of the growth curve, at least the earliest part of it. And, you know, during this part, it's there's sort of a land grab, but it's also where most of the consolidation actually occurs. It's pretty early, right? It's pretty early. And the concept here is that um, the top three during this phase are sort of between 15 and 45% of the entire market. Okay, so this is scale. Um, then we have focus. So this is where an industry is starting to mature, but still has a lot of growth, right? And so the top three are gonna make up 35 to 70%. Um, there's commonly a lot of private equity, um, institutional capital at this, at this phase, where you know, it's definitely established, there's still growth left. Um, there's some consolidation going on, right? And you, and the top three are about 35 to 70 percent. Then you've got balance, okay? And this is, you know, this is where the titans of industry kind of reign, like all those old economy stable businesses, right? Stable industries. This is where they hang out. The top three typically make up 70 to 90 percent, okay? But here's the thing that's that's super interesting. Um, the consulting firm AT Kearney uh, came out with a very uh, in-depth uh, research and thoroughly thought out um, alteration of the four stages of the life cycle of industry and the consolidation curve. Oh my gosh, look at the difference. So A.T. Kearney uh, did, looked at decades of research and did all kinds of analysis and, and thought to figure out what the um, consolidation life cycle actually looks like, and this is what they came up with, okay? And you'll sort of notice two things like really sticking out at you, right? The first is that it's not smooth at all. Um, and the second is that they actually made some modifications to the four stages that we were just looking at, okay? So here's the thing, why is it not smooth? Well, um, you know, ultimately they came out with um, technology, okay? Technological innovation and introduction uh, causes hiccups over time. Um, a big one for me was scale economies are not clear. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's small businesses or medium businesses and no one's really figured out yet how to how, how to um, consolidate those, you know, get that, that, get that economy of scale by size being meaningful or a competitive advantage, right? A lot of, um, um, you know, fractional um, um, decentralized industries out there have a lot of different players and they don't really know how to roll up or what the actual purpose is because it's not actually adding value to the end user, okay? Um, or, the, or the owner for, or the shareholders for that, for that matter, right? Um, economic development opens globally, okay? So there might be like new territories all of a sudden that expand and introduce new components, right? Or um, just general disruption. And you know, maybe this is, maybe this is technology, maybe it's a change in consumer behavior, maybe it's um, deregulation, uh, maybe it's a uh, economic depression or recession or something like that, I don't know. But the, but the point is, is this is really kind of what it looks like, okay? And when they came up with alterations or modifications to the four stages, okay, the real thing that they changed was you'll remember the opening, right? The opening was that that first part, okay, of the industry um, uh, life cycle and consolidation curve that allowed businesses to sort of enter into the market as major players, okay? This is super interesting, check it out. What AT Kearney decided, even though they made modifications, the big takeaway for me when you look at, when you look at what they came up with is that they added multiple reopenings throughout the process, okay? So you've got um, an opening right here, 
okay? But then you, there's sort of an, another time where it opens here. And this might be, it almost looks like a Bitcoin chart, right? Like, so, so you know, there's sort of this big pullback or this tech bust or, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, technology shifting things around. And then it booms up again, right? And it's really, um, you might disagree with me, but, but it's really like right here is another reopening. Um, side note, I've bought companies right there and used the new technology coming in to use that as a platform to grow different story. Um, so the point is, is that there's actually multiple reopenings uh, throughout the consolidation curve. And so I, I found this great because, you know, we, we like to look at um, small fragmented industries and, you know, sub 5 million, definitely sub $25 million acquisitions. And this kind of shows us what it is we're looking at. It's not this smooth curve, right? As we look at businesses to acquire, you see all kinds of stuff like this. As you look at businesses to start, okay, you might find different places um, to, to start and enter in, in that, in that place, in that industry. Okay. Uh, AT Kearney came up with this graph to determine, you know, who drives, uh, sort of acquisition initiatives in your industry. Is it you or do you want to let them, your competitors sort of do it? Right. And, um, here's the four quadrants. And the first one is first mover advantage. So if you are someone lucky enough to have, um, a product, an idea, you know, whatever it is that's sort of starting um, an industry in its space. Or remember those reopenings? If you're someone who's, who's able to take advantage of those multiple reopenings, um, you know, having a um, acquisition strategy in order to um, acquire uh, market share and maintain market share and scalability turns out to be actually very critical, okay? So that's a good time where you have a good opportunity to uh, to leverage acquisition skill sets. The other is when M and A speed is actually something that's adding value in the industry. Um, let's circle back to that. But basically, this is where a lot of consolidations are going on. Like it's like whoever can eat the most um, of all of the assets or businesses out there sort of wins, right? Then you have um, ga um, game changer. So this is when innovation kind of reigns. Okay, it's it's the opposite of consolidation, okay? And you know, a lot of times, you know, people say like Walker should 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 I like should every business be acquired? And I'm like, no. no. The thing is is like some business some startup ideas really are completely new game-changing things, right? And they they can consider acquiring assets that could be useful to launch, but the thing is is that, you know, most people um, are going to have a better success rate um, uh, and and uh, have a faster path to wealth. Uh, or uh, by buying existing companies, but um, innovation is also critical, right? And so, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, times when the game can be completely changed by a startup, that's, you know, this is when VC capital and all the rest of it plays. Defense. Defense is when external environments are shaking, are shaking out and still undetermined what's gonna happen, okay? Um, I did a video recently on, you know, the, the risk, how risk is sort of determined by external markets and how to sort of navigate your way through that. Um, this is when you're sort of waiting for things to play out because you don't know yet what's meaningful, okay? And it might make sense um, to be acquired, okay? Uh, and definitely let your other competitors do it while you sort of wait for that to determine. So when are, what are the sort of like strategic things that we need to be looking for at times when the speed of doing acquisitions is actually gonna matter in your industry, right? Um, and the first is when fixed costs, okay, are a large percentage or a big proportion of revenue, okay? And, um, you, know, you know, there's fixed costs and there's variable costs in a business, that'll have to be a different video, but when fixed costs, those, that, that monthly overhead becomes a big percentage that's typically when economies of scale can play in and help you um, in terms of, of, of adding more efficiencies um, um, to your business and, and being able to improve uh, the end user experience of that industry's uh, product or service. And so, you know, so economies of scale uh, identified through increase in a uh, big percentage of fixed costs, okay? Second is when information or data uh, is really meaningful in adding value to people. So, you know, there could be a product out there um, and, the, and the product is just the product, but all of a sudden uh, the data, okay, that comes from the use of the product becomes so valuable in increasing value to its end user 
that you can harness that data by acquiring market share. That's gonna be another one, okay? And the third is gonna be like network externalities. Like the more people that are on your platform are the thing that makes your platform uh, more valuable, okay? Um, I, you know, examples might be VCR versus beta, if you guys remember that. But you know, VCR won out because everybody started using uh, VCRs, okay? Um, and so those are the types of strategic things. And they're not always this, um, you know, the, th the you know most of the examples I just gave are sort of like innovation oriented sort of times, right? Uh, but it's not always, it could just simply be like, hey, there's, you know, a hundred, um, boat marinas and we're going to buy all of them and sort of centralize management to improve the experience marginally, but really we're just going to kind of build a cash cow by acquiring these businesses, right? Um, so, so these are those four, four areas. If we go back to um, how, where we started, okay, with the McKinsey article about programmable acquisitions creating the winners in every industry, okay, um, you know, ultimately the biggest takeaways uh, from from the application of this promatic uh, uh, acquisition system was number one, okay, they have clearly defined data, not ad hoc. They're not opportunistic. They're not sitting around wondering what they're going to do that month or that quarter and all of a sudden an opportunity arises or, you know, their competitor starts faltering and never done an acquisition, they jump in, right? That's not it. it, it this is a very systematized thing. You're talking about databases, CRMs, um, um, dashboards, right? And the acquisition search and process becomes a core competency to the business, okay? Because, say it with me, innovation and acquisition are equally important, okay? Um, and the second thing is that really practice makes perfect, right? So three things. One, it's a dedicated function within the business, and so that causes practice and, and repetitive um, execution of this, right? So you get a, um, um, and you build an expertise in your business, okay? Number two, you get codified learning from multiple deals. So, you know, as, as you as an entrepreneur or a team within your company start going out there and doing deals, what happens is you start to be able to identify different things, okay? And that's, that is one of the things we integrate into the acquisition lab, side note. Uh, and the third thing is that you get an end-to-end -end perspective, right? And so I think that, you know, going through practice and going through multiple acquisitions and being able to, you know, diversify um, um, your efforts in multiple ways through acquisition allows you to gain perspective on what works and what doesn't, okay? You know when you're going to have successful integrations. You know how important culture is. You know to get out of the spreadsheet and understand the people uh, involved and how that culture is going to going to interact with yours, right? So the question, you know, the question might be like, hey, I'm a budding entrepreneur, I'm a business owner, whatever it might be. And, you know, I don't have these kind of inroads. I don't know, you know, how to do acquisitions or how to practice, you know, entrepreneurship through acquisition or acquisition entrepreneurship. And the thing is, is that after spending um, a decade uh, buying multiple companies and, you know, um, tens of millions in revenue, um, I built the acquisition lab, basically after the success of Buy Them Build. And the acquisition lab is anchored in world-class education, a vetted community, okay? Only about 25 to 30% of applicants are actually accepted into the program. Um, resources, tools, uh, professional network, um, and uh, group coaching, or what I call diamond coaching. Uh, we have a, a different acquisition entrepreneur coaching you um, almost every single day of the week. And I run the search forum every other week where we go deep on your deals. So please check out acquisitionlab.com. We love senior applications. See you on the inside. Thanks so much.